Hi, I'm Chris Cooper. Welcome to the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Thanks for joining us. Fall is a great time of year for bird watching because in addition to birds we see year round, many other species are migrating through the area. Today, we're gonna to give you some ideas on making your yard more bird friendly so you can enjoy the birds of fall. And Mr. D is here with tips on cover crops and dealing with the fall army worm invasion. All that and more is just ahead on the family plot, gardening in of itself, so stay with us. This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for the family plot, gardening in the mid-south is provided by Goodwin's Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Miss Debbie Bruce. Miss Debbie is the Hi. owner of Wild Birds Unlimited. And Mr. Thank D is here. Hello. All right. Thank y'all for being here today. It's good to be here. All right, Ms. Debbie. Birds. Okay, so here's the question. How can we make our yards more bird friendly? Well, that's easy and it's a oh, lot of fun. Oh, it's easy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of fun, too. Think of your yard as an ongoing theater production. Oh. Okay? And right now, your habitat is changing. Okay. The scene is changing. And each season, whether it be spring, fall, whatever, is going to bring changes. But fall means migration time is sure. here, as it was in the spring, but birds are on the move. Okay. The Mid-South is blessed with a number of varieties hmm. of bird species. Okay. Some of them are year-round residents that live here all year long. Okay. And what are some of those? Oh, my goodness. Uh, depending on your habitat... Okay. You would have cardinals, blue jays, chickadees, tufted titmice, <laughs> nuthatch, the woodpecker family, doves, mockingbirds, wow. more. <laughs> and I've just mentioned those that you might see around your feeding area. Okay. How can we help prepare birds for migration? Okay. Well, with migration, you're going to have migrants that are going to pass through your yard or your habitat while they're traveling to different areas. They might not stay with you all season long, but okay. they're just passing through. Or you might have birds that are just returning for the winter, but your stage is, is changing. So migration is a very perilous time for birds mm -hmm. too. Millions and millions of birds are on the move, but not millions and millions are gonna be successful in getting wow. to their grounds. Wow. But you can prepare by enhancing your yard for those travelers. Okay. Pretend that you're on a, a road trip. Okay. <laughs> okay. Long car drive. All right. And what are the things that you want to look for at the end of your trip? Food, water, and shelter. That and that's what the birds are looking for that as well. Okay. And can I can ask you, so where are the birds migrating to? Where are they going? Oh, good question. Okay. We are going to be into south migration, okay. fall migration. So the birds that have gone up to the North America, not just the United States, but farther into Canada, mm -hmm. are gonna go back into their wintering grounds. Some will move just down to our area, such as the white-throated sparrow, mm -hmm. the white-crowned sparrow. Uh, but some, such as the warblers that nested farther in North America, are gonna go all the way down to the neotropical wow. area. South America. Hey, they're going out there have a good time. That sounds good <laughs> that time of the year, doesn't it, for the winter? Mm -hmm. All right, now let's talk about food, okay, because you have, uh, we have some food displayed mm -hmm. here, so you want to talk a little bit about that? I did bring some food, yes. Um, when you're enhancing your yard f for birds, you want to do both natural and both supplemental. Okay. I have brought supplemental foods, but first you want to garden for the birds. Garden for the birds. You want to garden okay. for the birds. Right. Now want, how, how do we do that? You want to plant things that are going to produce berries. Okay. Either as a summer crop or a fall or winter crop. You're going to want to plant things that produce fragrance so the bugs come in. So your insect eaters will want to eat mm, those. Okay. 
and you want to leave your garden a little bit messy. Be a lazy <laughs> gardener. Don't clean up. Don't overdo your cleaning up because you want to. You can do that. You, that. <laughs> you want to leave those seed heads up so your finches will come in and, and eat the Rebecca or eat the Echinacea seeds mm -hmm. or the basil seeds. You want to leave things to mimic nature because when you stop and think about it, there's no one out there mowing and raking the forest. Yes. So you want to always mimic nature to bring in nature to your yard. Wow, that is it. And then you want to provide supplemental foods. Okay. The supplemental foods will give the birds help in the fall and winter, of course, but they're going to pull them out of the, the foliage of the trees so you can enjoy watching them. <laughs> And you want a variety of feeders and a variety of foods okay. and a variety of levels where you're spacing your feeders. Not everyone wants to sit at the table when they eat. <laughs> and just like birds sometimes want to eat low to the ground or some species like to be up high. Okay. So you want all different, all different options for them. Okay. I brought a bark butter feeder. And the bark butter feeder is this little one with the kind of a burgundy colored roof mm -hmm. and you're going to take that bark butter and press it into those holes and hang it up high and with that your woodpecker species, oh. your chickadees, your tufted titmice they're going to cling to that and eat that high fat substance. You can also take the bark butter and just push it into the tree bark that's how it got its name. Oh, okay. Or the feeder with the white cylinder. Okay. Maybe you have trouble with squirrels. Squirrels generally do not like safflower seeds, so that would be a good one to place in your habitat. But the house finch and the cardinals love it, so that's an option for okay. you. The one on the bench with the um, yellow top is a thistle feeder or okay. niger feeder. And that's your targeting your goldfinch, your house finch. In the middle would be a tube feeder. We have that filled with a, a good blend or a choice blend and you're targeting all the seed-eating songbirds that can perch on that and eat, and that would be for elevation. Okay. Your chickadees, your tufted titmice, your nuthatch. Next to it is a peanut feeder, and that's yeah. one of the favorite feeders in our yard. Okay. Birds love peanuts. Okay. It's a, a high-fat product. They can't get enough of it. If you have nuthatch, sometimes you'll see a nuthatch pull a peanut out, and go to a large tree and stick it in the crevice mm. of the bark. Well, your nuthatch goes upside down when he's going down the tree. How about that? But the woodpeckers yeah. like to come in and take a peanut, and sometimes they'll hide it for later in the bark of the tree, but they go up. <laughs> so the two are not competing for their little food okay. storage there. They're kind of hiding it from one another. Wow, how about that? Okay. Another natural or uh, yeah, supplemental that. food that is one of the most popular, especially with folks that feed bluebirds and robins or mockingbirds or that, but all the birds love this, is your mealworms. It's mm. a live beetle larva. And oh my goodness, they love they love those live mealworms. And while we have just a little time left, Ms. Debbie, why do they like these mealworms so much? <laughs> Well, in the springtime, they're going to use them for their nestlings, but when you think about it, out in nature, they're going to look for caterpillar and other kind of larva and high protein. There you are. Yeah. High protein. High protein. Okay. Then the other thing you need to keep in mind when you're looking for a safe place, if you're a bird, is water. Okay. Water is so important, not just in the hot summer, but in the winter as well. Sure. You want a shallow bath. We brought one that has a actually a heater that is nice. embedded in the bath. So in the winter time, you can have open water. And then make sure you have a safe yard. Okay. Just like sure. when you're finished with your road trip, you want a safe place to That's stay. Right. Well, the birds want a safe place to roost with bushes and trees and shrubs to hide from predators. And please keep your cats indoors. Oh. Okay. Keep cats indoors. Uh, we like cats. We have a cat at the shop, okay. but she's an indoor bird she's watcher. In. Okay. <laughs> Ms. David, thank you for that wonderful information. That was, that was good. It was. All right. Thank you. You're so welcome. Okay. Thank you. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you.
right, Mr. D, there's been a fall army worm invasion in a couple of counties here. I know I've heard Tipton County, Fayette County, uh, here in Shelby County, so what do we need to know about? You know, um, you know, I was looking at these mealworms here, and I'm trying to figure out a way to catch <laughs> army worms. If we could catch those critters, bottle them up, we could feed them to the birds. Feed them the to the birds. Because one of the first indications of a fall army worm uh -huh. infestation is a bunch of birds out there in your yard feeding. Yeah. If you have a bunch of birds that fly out there, you better go look right now because yeah. there, there, there's a reason. And, and unfortunately, there aren't enough birds to eat all the fall army worms My that we goodness. have. They, they. When they hatch out, they're, they're just, the numbers are so huge, they can totally defoliate a yeah. lawn or, mm -hmm. or uh, you know, a lot of the agricultural crops, they can, they can really be a problem. So I guess that's why they call them army? That's why they call army them army worms, because yeah. it's army of them. I know a few years ago, when I was a young agent down in Mobile, <laughs> Alabama, I snipped off a peach tree limb, a short branch, and uh, it had a little disease on, on the, one of the leaves, and I was trying to figure out what it was, so I brought it to the office, and I put it on top of the filing cabinets in my secretary's office and uh, left it there and came back the next morning. I did not notice that there was a fall army worm egg mass oh, wow. on one wow. of the leaves <laughs> and they hatched overnight. And there was just a covering of thousands and thousands of little bitty tiny oh. army worms going from that branch down over the top of the file cabinet, all the way to the floor and across the floor. I mean, <laughs> it's just amazing how many there are in one egg mass. Right. And they're gregarious in nature. They 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 feed together and and uh, they can just really do a lot of damage. We've right. got several products on the market that are listed that will control. And before you get to that, Mr. D, it seems like every couple of years we have you know these fall army worm invasions. Because I can remember a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, there was some invasions here in Shelby County, in Madison County, uh, but yeah, every couple of years. Just conditions, if conditions are right, and I'm not sure what those conditions right. are, okay. uh, you'll have them. I do know I was sitting in a, uh, a lab up at Murray State the other day, and uh, a call came in, and, and uh, one of my guys I work with put the phone, the call on the speakerphone, and he said, there's a lot of butterflies are, are flying around. What are they? What are these butterflies? There's lots of them, little bitty ones flying around all over the place. And I said, I don't know, but it's probably not a good thing. And it was probably a moth flight yeah. uh, of uh, the fall army yeah. worm. It's probably what it yeah. was, seeing, seeing the infestation. But we, it's getting a tremendous amount of pressure from fall army worms. Okay. All right, well, let's get rid of them. Okay, we, let's, let's do, do it. That. And we've got several things that'll okay. do the trick. Uh, the pyrethrins, like beta cyfluthrin, is a, is a, and I'm going from the 2014 Red Book. Okay. Uh, uh, Amatocloprid uh, is uh, another product that's on the list. Uh, gamma cyhalothrin uh, is a, a product that uh, we recommend. Uh, bifenthrin and cyfluthrin, as opposed to beta cyfluthrin, both cyfluthrin and beta cyfluthrin okay. are recommended. Uh, Spinosad yeah. is also recommended, and uh, gamma cyhalothrin I've already mentioned, and then Grubex. Chlorantranolaprol, I don't know whether I pronounced that right or not, <laughs> is also enough. recommended to control uh, the, uh, the army worms. And uh, these, are, this, these products are also labeled and recommended for cutworm control too. Okay. Uh, but uh, army, I've never seen an infestation of cutworms, uh, you know, heavy enough in a turf grass that re re would require spraying. Mm -hmm. But uh, follow the label, yes, any please of these products, that. follow yes. the label uh, as always, and uh, this should, uh, should do the trick for you, and it, you know the sooner that you can get out there, if they're just in one corner of your yard, I mean they're not over the whole yard. You can actually spot trick, right? And if you can, you know, wipe them out along that line of uh, that they've penetrated, you ought to be able to take them out. Okay. All right, and now let's transition to cover crops. Okay, cover crops. Let's talk a little bit about cover crops. Okay, it's a good it's a good thing to uh, to do to you know purpose of cover crops is to uh, you know, prevent soil erosion right. is probably one of the main things that you, that cover crops do. They uh, uh, prevent leaching and en enhance uh, uh, nutrient availability, which will increase yields. You know, of, of you know your crops next mm -hmm. year. Uh, they are also uh, beneficial in that they can help smother weeds. They can become a weed <laughs> if you plant the wrong cover crop. Right. So be sure that you plant the right cover crop. But they also provide habitat. To, yeah. to critters, you know, in, in the winter time, and and uh, they they uh, increase organic matter in the soil, 
Uh, I've already mentioned it prevents erosion. They also improve infiltration, soil infiltration, mm -hmm. by, because it in, uh, increases organic matter in the soil and helps retain uh, r water, uh, the soil, uh, water holding capacity of soils. So oh, those are all, all good things good that, that cover crops do. And, and you know, there's several that, that you can plant now. Okay. Uh, crimson clover, several of the clovers, crimson clover, uh, red clover, white clover, sweet clover are all uh, legumes, right. which which are very very common, and and I mean I've known farmers, uh, grape producers, uh, muscadine grapes who planted uh, uh, crimson clover in between you know in their rows between their rows of grapes, and they did not have to add nitrogen. Wow, that legume so fixed that enough nitrogen yeah. in the soil that he did not have to add nitrogen for those fruit crops. That's pretty good. So that can really really yeah. cut down your your nitrogen fertilizer cost. Uh, hairy vetch, Austrian yeah. winter pea uh, are, are other good legumes that you can put out there. Now there's some non-legumes that grow very fast that you can put out there such as cereal, rye, mm -hmm. wheat. Uh, you know, hey, if you want to eat your cover crop, mustards and turnip <laughs> greens and things like that make good cover crops, but you can also, you know, harvest the yeah. tops and eat them. And um, tall fescue, you know, you can plant fescue uh, out there as a but it's, it's, this, some of these, uh, the tall fescue is a perennial, so yeah. it'll, it'll it'll come back. It'll come back. And, and and some of these some of these are, are perennials. Wheat, of course, is an is an annual. But uh, most of these, uh, the planting date is between October uh, August the fifteenth to October one. So anytime during the month of September, uh, you can plant most of these. The seeding rate, mm -hmm. and the depth varies. I'm just going to give you a few examples. Uh, Crimson clover, you plant about a pound per 1,000 square feet, and you plant it about a half inch deep. Uh, hairy vetch, about a pound, but it needs to be between between one and two inches thick. Okay. That's why you need to be careful if you mix cover crops. Make sure that a large seeded cover crop, you probably need to, if you want to mix them, to provide a little bit of diversity out there, you need to, you know, may, you may want to plant the large seeded first, deeper, and then go over the top with a small seeded, more shallow. Okay, thanks for that information, Mr. D. That's good. All right, this is our Q and A session, and Ms. Debbie, you jump in there with us if you have something to say. <laughs> All okay. Right. All right, and here's our first uh, viewer email, and a couple of photos from John. Our ornamental plum tree has developed a scale on the trunk and limbs, and has begun dropping leaves early for the past two years. Also, there were few blossoms this past spring. Is there a treatment you can recommend to save the tree? We have the tree there on the screen. What did you think, Mr. D? You know, uh, the first thing I thought of was white peach scale. And, and, and white peach scale can, I'm, I don't think it's white peach scale because I think white peach scale would have already killed that tree. Right. You know, it, it completely girdles the tree and it will kill it. So that makes me think that it's either San Jose scale or a terrapin, terrapin scale. Right. They tend to, you know, they don't kill the trees quite as as, as quickly as, as white peach scale. Uh, but at this point, this time of the year, really, there's not a lot that he can do other than, than wait until till full dormancy. And then I would go in there with a with a good dormant oil mm -hmm. spray and, and, and spray that tree really good with that. And then next year, there are some products that he can use. We do need to identify whether it's San Jose or yeah, Terrapin. Like I, I know with the Terrapin scale, there's some things that you can use that you that's not recommended for San Jose, and that's the, mainly the systemics, yeah. like Marathon and Merit, Merit uh, yeah. Safari, uh, Flagship, Arena, uh, but uh, Discus and Electus SC are also uh, products that are recommended to Terrapin, Terrapin scale, in addition to the products I'm about to mention okay. that are recommended for San Jose scale. San Jose during the growing season, horticultural oil, also, and again, this is for both San Jose and Terrapin scale. Horticultural oil will help you if you uh, put it out there when the crawlers are active. Okay. So you, active. You, you, if you wait until you see the problem, you know, you're, you're too late. But diazinon, seven, carbaryl, malathion, orthene, tristar, talus, dursban, safari, and <laughs> distance. Lots are all products yeah. out of the 2014 Red Book that are recommended to control both San Jose and Terrapin scale. And I hope that helps you out, Mr. John. And something else I'd like to add too, 
I do know that ornamental plum trees have problems with uh, bores. Oh, yes. And it's the peach tree bore. So if you look down there, you see any frass, you know, down on the ground and the little holes, you know, in the trunk uh, toward the bottom, that could be a bore. So right. that's the peach tree bore. And there's also a lesser peach tree bore. Which is but, up higher. Yeah, which is up tree. higher. Yeah. But I do know that ornamental plum trees have problems with bores. So, yeah, right. we do need to... Make sure we identify and use, that. Go, and there's not a lot that you can treat. Yeah. There's only a couple of products Just a that couple. are labeled for, yeah. for boards. Durban and, and uh, permethrin. And that's and you could do that in June, July, yeah. you know, in the yeah. summertime. So yeah. there you have it, Mr. John. Okay, here's our next uh, viewer email from Katie. My perennial dropped all its leaves because of irregular watering and being root bound in a small pot. It finally sent out new leaves in September. The second set of leaves is very light green in color. Should I fertilize the plant? We're talking about a perennial. This is going to be late in September. I'll wait. It's an outside plant, I'm assuming. Yes. I wouldn't fertilize it now. No. I, I would wait for that, Miss Katie. And here's the second part of her question. I had a similar problem with an uh, enormous Asclepius incarnata, which is the swamp milkweed, okay, which I dug and transplanted while in full bloom. It continued to bloom for two weeks, but has now dropped 95% of its leaves. Then up came a second set of leaves that looked pale. I don't want to encourage further sprouting at this late date. What should I do? Again, you know, we're late until, you know, until the season. Yeah, well, I wouldn't, Mother, I would Nature, wait. Mother Nature is taking care, it's doing some pruning itself, uh -huh. and, and I let Mother Nature hang, you know, Keep on doing the things that need to be done right now. Next spring, you can go with fertilizers. Yeah, next spring, you can go with the fertilizers. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some, uh, you know, osmocotes or, you know, some of your other, you know, time-released uh, right. fertilizers you can go with. Uh, or right. some uh, all-general-purpose fertilizers can work as well. But something else, too, about this, um, if you already have a plant that's established and you're trying to transplant it, that plant is in shock. Right. It goes into shock. Mm -hmm. So when it goes into shock, of course, it's going to drop. You know, it's leaves. And you didn't get all the roots. Yeah. You know, there's no way you can get all the roots when mm -hmm. you're trying to transplant one. And so in the summertime, when a plant is in full bloom, is not the best time to transplant it. Not the best time. If you want to transplant, wait till the winter time. Yeah. And when, when, you know, they're pretty much dormant. There you have it. Uh, next question. Mushrooms have popped up in my yard after recent rains. Do I need to do anything to get rid of them? I've seen a lot of mushrooms out there. No big yeah. deal. You just can mechanically to, remove them with a broom or you if you want to, but they're not, yeah, they ain't doing anything. just doing their thing. Decaying organic material, organic mm -hmm. matter is all it is, so it's no big problem. The next question, my okra pods are tough. Any reason why they're tough? Are they picking them when they ought to be picked? I think they might be picking them too late. They pick a little bit. That's what you think so, Ms. I would think so. Yeah, yeah. two or three inches woody. long. Yeah, they get woody. They, they mm -hmm. do if you leave them on there too long. Yeah, about what, two, two inches? Yeah. yeah, don't go for big okra pods. Go for <laughs> small, tender okra pods. Right. Okay, and here's our last uh, question. We definitely want to get to this, Mr. D. I heard Mr. D talk about wet worms on a previous show. I, had them, uh, I have them in my pecan tree, but they are too hot in the tree for me to do anything about it. Should I be concerned? Not really. I've never seen web worms kill a pecan tree. Uh, they can kind of make a mess, but you know, one thing you may want to try uh, is uh, uh, BT is, mm -hmm. is a, will, will kill web worms. And you might put some BT in a hose end sprayer that you can develop some velocity. <laughs> and if you can spray that up into that tree around that web and get as much of it on the foliage as you can, if a web worm happens to feed on that back bacillus thuringiensis, it will kill him. He'll die. He'll catch a bad stomach ache and die. So, you know, you might want to try that, but, but it's not going to kill your pecan okay. tree. They, okay. they are very uh, tough and, and uh, it might stress it a little bit, but pecan okay. trees are, can handle all okay. web worms. And remember before, we, you know, somebody sent in a question about using the cider <laughs> oh. and then the wasps come in. And, and since we have Miss Debbie here, if you get that web open, you can let the birds come in to try right. take care of those uh, right. wet worms. It's a self-feeder up there. That's yeah. up high. Yeah, yeah. that'll do it. All right. Well, thank you, Miss Debbie. Thank Today, you. we're out of time. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us a letter or an email with your gardening questions. Send your email to familyplot at wknl.org. The mailing address is Family Plot, 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38016. 
You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next time for The Family Plot, Guarding in the Mid-South. Be safe. Production funding for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwin's Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation The WKNO Production Fund The WKNO Endowment Fund and by viewers like you. Thank you.